We'll turn uh, back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This morning I got through verses 1 through, I think, 4. Um, we'll, we'll go through um, verses 5 through 6. And I'll, give, I'll give a short little summary, sort of kind of about what this morning was, but really... Um, Really, they're a standalone message on, on, on all themselves because that's kind of how God, that's kind of how God engineered the whole Bible, the, the Scripture. Is that you can dissect one verse, one word in a verse, a paragraph, an entire chapter, however you attack it or however you approach it. There's something to learn from it. So, Second uh, Peter, starting in um, chapter one, verse one. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance. To perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, um, I talked about projecting perfection. That a lot of times in our community, in our place, and inside our church even, we project an image of perfection. Not that everything is good in our lives, not that everything is okay in our lives or stuff that we're dealing with, but an image of, um, I'm the example that you should follow. I'm the Christian standard. I'm the way that you should try to be. If you're not doing like I am, then you're beneath, you're, you haven't gotten that far spiritually, and that's, you have that in all kinds of different people, in all kinds of different churches, and we easily say, but that's not right because Jesus Christ is the standard, but then we continue to continue living that way, um, and we say, yeah, Jesus is the standard, and I'm just below him because I'm following him, and I'm doing everything right. But the, the truth is, Peter, in this letter, Peter's writing to people inside the church. You get that in the very first few verses. And he says, to those who have obtained like precious faith. He's talking to saved Christians, saved people. Later in um, verse 9, he says, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. He's writing to people who have been cleansed. These are not new converts. This isn't a message, a letter that he's writing to people to try to win them over in Jesus. He's talking to people that are in the church that are having problems in the church. I say that to get to get to the depressing part, the part that I've been burdened, I've been burdened more than a week over it, not because I didn't know this already, but just because when you study this and you read this kind of stuff, it makes you realize, man, yeah. When the world, one, the things that we're dealing with in this country and, and throughout the rest of the world, they're not new things. It's not, it's not new. This um, corruption through lust. Lust is, can, you can, I, I can, I can person, 
personally, I can personally point to the source of all of my problems from the time from the time I was a, a child until now. And at the at the bottom of every single one of them is some kind of lust or perversion or sexual immorality. It's it's that's the beginning of everything. Whether it was alcoholism or divorce or adultery or spending too much money or bankruptcy or whatever it was, at the bottom of it, the source of all of it was some desire for something sexual. That's just me. I feel like when I read the Bible, I could, I could say the same is true for a lot of people. And you look at the state that our world is in right now, and what is the biggest driver? The biggest driver for dividing this nation isn't whether or not we should wear masks. It's things like abortion that are things that we're not talking about so much right now because of the coronavirus, but it is very much a problem. And it's more, it's more I heard, uh, I think I heard, I don't remember if it was Franklin Graham or, I think it was Franklin Graham that I heard say uh, it's, it's more detrimental than the Holocaust. There have been more babies, newborn babies killed than, than there were Jews in the Holocaust. And we don't talk about it that way, but we should. I saw a um, gay pride. Well, we've got gay pride um, posters in schools and libraries. I've seen posts and pictures of that stuff on Facebook. And I know Facebook is full of fake news, but you don't have to Google it too hard to find out if it's true. And there are lots of schools in this country that are teaching LBGTQ history as if it was the civil rights, as if it was the civil war or um, uh, women's rights to vote. It's, it's not on the same plane. It's not in the same category, but they're putting it that way because that's the center, the source of most of the corruption in this world that we're trying to flee from. But it's not a new thing. When you read through Corinthians, Paul wrote some letters to the Corinthians because they have problems. Realize that most of, the, most of the letters that we cherish, most of the New Testament letters that we cherish are by, written by apostles to churches that had some issues and they were trying to combat those issues. When you read through Corinthians, you'll find um, some interesting stuff about um, fathers and sons fighting over the same woman about women who are dressing as men and men dressing as women so they can't really tell who's praying out loud. Is it a man praying or a woman praying? That's where the long hair and the coverings and stuff come in. This is why you should wear the things you should wear because we can't tell there was a gender confusion because you had a lot of Greeks coming into the church. And I didn't realize this either until I studied it that in places like Rome and Greece, and when they, when they were, were uh, race in the Colosseum, you know Paul references the races a lot, run the race with endurance. You realize that the Olympics were, the Olympics were ran naked. Most of, the, most of the games were played in the Colosseum naked. It was very naked. It's a very naked place. And people would come into the temple and church to naked. No, no, you don't, no, you don't do that. I don't have a problem with you wearing a hat into the prayer meeting. I'm going to wrap you up if you come in naked. I'm just, it makes me uncomfortable. You know, they had a problem with those things. And I saw a sign recently, it was, a, it was at a, a gay pride march or something, whatever. It's was, it was two uh, homosexual women and they were, they were laughing and, and having just a, you know, having this, they had this sign up, going to hell and proud of it. They don't know what they're saying. They don't understand what they're saying. They, they're missing, they're missing that. And, and here's, here's why. What I think is why this is, this is. Peter tells us here to add some things to ourselves to help, to help us add some things. And here's what he says to add. Giving all diligence to add to your faith. Add to your faith. You gotta have faith. Add to that virtue. Virtue is integrity and character and all the things that we used to hold in high regard in this country before my time, before my dad's time. Those were things that were taught by the military, by the Boy Scouts, just by your parents. They taught those things to be a person of integrity, a man of your word, they would say. Integrity is doing the right thing even when nobody else is looking or if you're not going to get a pat on the back for it. That's, that's when you would give anonymously and you didn't want to tell people by whispering in their ear, you know, it was me that really did that. Because you wanted that pat on the back. That's integrity. 
He says, to virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. We have to have knowledge. Not just knowledge of, of our Bible and who God is and who we are and then who Jesus is because of who we are and how we failed that relationship with God. But knowledge of what's going on in the world. Not just what we're taught on TV, but what we see at the dollar store, at the gas station. Every single time I go to the gas station and I get behind somebody who buys 15 of those scratch-off tickets, I, I just it, it just, it doesn't make me sick. I'm not disgusted, but I think, why are you gambling away money that I'm sure you worked hard for? That doesn't make any sense to me. But it's the exact same feeling I get when I see people buying alcohol. Or, or, I mean, I don't know why people do the things they do, but they do because they're weaknesses, weaknesses that the devil tries to exploit. He knows where we're weak and he plays on those weaknesses with temptation. We have to know what's going on around us. In the army, we call it situational awareness. Stay alert, stay alive. If you know what's going on around you 360, you'll be okay. But then the best thing about that, when you're in combat, or any kind of combat situation, you don't have to worry about 360. You ever heard somebody say, I got your six? You know what six is? It's six o'clock. If you're looking on a clock, we used to divide up into pairs. We call them battle buddies. And then you'd have teams and everybody would have a clock direction, 10 to two, three to whatever. You know what I'm saying? And hey buddy, don't worry about it, I got your six. As Christians, as a family, we're supposed to have each other six. I don't have to worry about 360. I can trust that you're working while I'm working, while you're working while I'm working, and we're all working together for the same goal, for the same thing. So we gotta have knowledge of what's going on around us. We gotta have self-control. That's the toughest. If, in my personal opinion, if I could control myself, I'd have no problem telling you how to control yourself. But I got a real problem telling you how to control yourself because I'm out of control. I struggle every day trying to control my tongue, my thoughts, my actions, every single day. But I'm not the only one. That's a hard one, but it's something what we have to practice. We have to be self-controlled. When somebody says something to us, we gotta bite our tongue as much as we can. When somebody does us wrong, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to turn the other cheek. We have to practice these things, and sometimes we won't get them right. Sometimes we'll have a temptation and we fail to it, or we fall to it. But like Brother Glenn was saying, practicing it and falling to it are two different things. We can't be someone who's practicing it. Say you, you can't have a minister who's in the middle of adultery or just left his wife. You, you can't have uh, an alcoholic come into the church 16 weeks straight drunk. Like I know you're, I know you're struggling with alcohol and I'm not going to turn you away, but you understand you're practicing the sin. You're not just falling to it. You see, it's not something that you, you can say, I, I only fall to the, you know, I only do this because it's my weakness. It's the thorn God gave me in my side. That don't work. It says my grace is sufficient. It doesn't say my grace is sufficient and you can keep on doing it. It don't work that way. We have to try, try self-control. We have to work on it. And we have to work on it through perseverance. We have to continuously persevere. The funny thing about racing, and Paul constantly talks about racing, you know, uh, when you run one race, makes makes the next race easier, right? It might make you more fit to run the race, but it doesn't make the race easier. It's the same way with a battle. You win one battle, makes it easier to win the next one. Every single battle field, every single battlefield is its own. Every one of them have their own problems. Every, every fight, that, and this, this one's a head-on, this one's up a hill, this one's flanked, they're flanking us. This one was an IED. We have no idea who's, who, who tried to blow us up. This one over here is a firefight. We actually have somebody we can shoot back at. This, you know, they're all different. But what happens is when you fight one, 
it makes you tougher to fight the next. It makes you tougher to fight the next and the next and the next. And you become a seasoned soldier, a seasoned combatant. The same way with running a race. You train hard, you run a race, and then the next time you run a race, it's not the first time you've been there. They, they tell me that when I, when I started hunting deer, I'm telling myself all night long. I was, I, I came, I came in, I, when I met Amanda, y'all were here when I met her, I was something different. I had a beard. I mean, I could have been anybody I wanted to be. Could have changed my name. She, she thought it was funny that I didn't change my name. I could be, instead of Earl, I could have gone by Joseph. Nobody here knew any better. Nobody knew anything that I could have gone by, anything I wanted to go by, you know, because I was brand new. But I didn't. I went by Earl. And then I started going deer hunting with them because I'd never been deer hunting and I always wanted to go. I'd been in the Army. That's where I learned how to shoot. They thought, my drill sergeants thought it was funny that I didn't know anything about a, a gun or a rifle, and I'm from Kentucky. And they tried to get me. What's the, uh, what's the capital of Kentucky, son? Is it Louisville or Louisville? I said, it's Frankfurt, drill sergeant. Oh, you're a smart aleck. You know, and they got on me, man. I could have won. I could have said Louisville, and they got me for not saying Frankfurt. You know, if I say Frankfurt, and I'm a smart A, you know. But I got here, and I went deer hunting with them, and you know what I did? I missed. I missed a lot, not just once. See, I didn't have a rifle, and Billy let me use his 30 out six, and I'm not the best shot in the world, but you'd think I was because I was in the Army. And until then, everybody thought I was, but I wasn't. You know why? It was different stuff. I'd never done this before. Not like this, never deer hunted. I, I, I've been in, on the battlefields, totally, totally different. It's suppression, not marksmanship. It's move under fire and move your troops and direct and whatever. It was different, but I got better at it. I'm still not great, but it was by practice. And what they told me, the advice that they gave me, when, when you get that big buck, because I had buck fever, man, I'm talking about buck fever. Because I've never had one, you know, and I want, I did, I ain't lying, I wanted one. Act like you've been here before. Act like this ain't your first time. Don't think of it as your first big buck. Don't think of it as your first deer. Act like you've been here before. It's the exact same way with a race. If you're coaching a kid and you're trying to tell them, or, or the kids are up to bat, t-ball, or, or you're facing some kind of trial, or you're under some kind of hardship, or you're witnessing to somebody for the very first time, act like you've done it before. Go into a job interview. They wear the pants the same way you do. Don't, don't put them on any kind of pedestal Act like you've been there before. Act like they are lucky to get you. Act like when you're ministering to somebody, they're blessed to have you sharing the gospel with them. Not that you need to think, oh, I wish somebody else was here doing this because, man, I just don't got the words. No, they're blessed to have you there right then and right there. In the same way with a, a struggle or a trial that you're going through, why me? Nope, this is mine to have. God gave this to me, and thank God he gave it to me and not that person. Thank God he put this on me. And, and this, this is how I look at this. If anybody in my house is going to get cancer, I want it to be me. Anybody in my house. I don't want to leave my family. I love them, and I'd love to spend, I'd love to be there with them until the day that, that they were all grandparents. But that's probably not going to happen. And I don't want to leave them, but I would rather leave than any one of them leave. I want them to have a chance at life. I want to be the one to struggle through that pain, not them. And that's easy to say when I'm not struggling through pain. But it's from the heart. I, I know that God would give me the strength and the self-control and the perseverance when that came. And I pray that that's how we should, we should look at the world that way. No, I don't want to die, but I'd, I'd rather this affliction be on me so that maybe you can see him through it. That's all we want to be is a reflection of, of God. We saw the moon. We went out last night looking at deer cameras. I'm, I'm stuck on deer season. We went out to pull cameras late at night. We were riding around the back of the truck. Man, the kids loved it. The moon was shining bright, and my seven-year-old Natalie, she says, uh, man, that moon's bright. Or no, Asher said something about man, the moon being bright. And now they said, yeah, that's just the moon reflecting the, the light off of the sun. 
And I'm not happy because she's so smart about that, but that's exactly, I've used that illustration. The reason she remembers that is because I've used that illustration where they're talking about how we're supposed to reflect the light of Jesus in the world, just like the moon reflects the light of the sun. They're learning those things. And that's what we need to be. See Jesus through us. Let his name be exalted through us. And then lastly, and this is, this is where I was going with this, to perseverance godliness, which is what we talked about this morning, living a godly life. To godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Here's where the big confusion is in the world. If you were to ask anybody in the world who the nicest, kindest, lovingest people are, I don't know that they would say Christians. Because the truth is, this country anyway, and I don't know about the rest of the world, but from what I see, most people don't look at us as kind, loving people. They don't even see us as tolerant. That's what we talked about this morning. There's a big difference between what tolerance actually means and what they want it to mean. They want tolerance to mean acceptance. That by me tolerating this, I'm accepting it and telling you it's right. But that's not what tolerance means. Tolerance means I can tolerate what's happening. I have no control over you and I can, I can put up with it. I can endure it. It doesn't affect me. But the minute it starts affecting me, it becomes intolerant on your part. People think that we're trying to shove our faith and religion down their throats because we want them to not have what they want to have. Because that's the argument that's been made so much. Who are you to tell me who I can and cannot love? Who are you to tell me that I can't love somebody of the same sex? That makes you prejudiced against me because you're limiting what I can do. I love this person. Why do you get to tell me who I do or do not love? And that prejudice makes you unkind. You're not kind. You're not a kind person. You'll give money to things and do things for people, but, but in truth, you're a hypocrite because you only do that to people who are of the same color, or, or if you do it to somebody of a different color or a different nation, it's almost as if you're patting them on the head for being lesser. That's how they see us. The problem with that, that they won't admit, but we have to understand, is it's their definition of love and kindness are as skewed as their definition of tolerance. It's not me telling you you can't love, by, love somebody of the same sex. It's God. It's not me. I didn't say that. It's not my rule. It's God's rule. And what makes, what gives God the authority to make that rule? He's God. All I can do is tell you the truth of it. Then you have to take that truth and do something with it. Truth is, is not always the easiest thing to hear. But they don't see us as kind. That's why they steer away from us. That's why the doors are not broken down because the world says, this country says, we want to make a happy place for everybody. It's social justice. Everybody should get a chance to have something. You work hard for something and you earn it, that's great. But they should get a chance too. I'm in total agreement. But if they have the chance and they don't take it, they don't deserve to be rewarded for it. And yet they are because it's about social equilibrium. It's about making things not just fair, a fair chance. I mean, we're not even winning the same race. We're, we're running the race, and at the end, they're getting the same trophy I'm getting when I'm the one ran the race. God made this system because of that. It's fair. We all have a fair choice. We all have an option. We have to choose. When someone chooses not to choose, when they choose not to vote, when they choose not to, when you mention the name of Jesus or you talk about, you know, I don't want to think about life and death, man. That's too heavy. I, you know, Jesus, whatever, man. I think me and the universe got this figured out. You're making a choice. You're either for him or you're against him. And that's the truth. That's, that's the truth. It's, it's, not, it's not a fun truth because I don't want to tell someone that they are potentially uh, damning their eternal soul. I don't want to say that. 
but it's the truth. What would I be if I was a doctor and I, I had an x-ray and this person is going to die in two days of a, of a disease and I have the vaccine, but I choose not to say it because it might make him uncomfortable. I mean, I'd get fired, I hope. <laughs> but that's that's exactly it. And here's, here's what we got to remember at a verse 8. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what that implies is if these things are not ours, if we're not working on our self-control, if we're not persevering, if we don't show brotherly kindness and love, if we don't do that to people, especially inside the church, because that's who, G that's who Peter is writing to, we start here. If we're not doing that here, then we will be unfruitful and we will be barren. Barren, barren's a heavy word for me. Unfruitful, we'll understand because we're, we're in a farm country and um, we're doing a project at home where we got to find a seed to grow. And I said, well, we're in the right place for it. I mean, this is farm country, you know, so we understand being fruitful or unfruitful. What about barren? Have you ever talked to anyone who wanted children but couldn't have them? How sad that is and how hard they tried? I don't want us, not just Tilden, but the church, the church in this place to be barren. That we've got the, the ability, and the tools, and the know-how, but we're barren. That we're not producing anything. We're not advancing the kingdom. We're not helping people be successful when they come in the doors. How hard it is to get people in the doors. We had, we had some visitors recently that it is still it is still so heavy on my heart that finally got them to come to church and they started coming a few times here and there and then something that uh that i can't we can't control the coronavirus we cannot control social distancing we cannot control um wearing masks not wearing masks that kind of thing and we've left it up to people to make their own decision on what they do they haven't been back there are other people who are looking for children's ministries, a place to take their kids. We don't have one. So when people say, you got anything for the kids? Not yet. Want to, hope to. We, um, I don't know, there's, there's places that people go and they get taught the wrong gospel. They get taught a thing that tells them that you have Jesus and your life's going to get better. And then their life doesn't get better or they, they run into some kind of hardship or struggle. And then, well, my life isn't better, so forget this Jesus. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's, that's, ev that's everywhere. There's places where that happens. And then all they need is one bad religious experience and then they'll try something else. Why do you think we have such a drug problem? An alcohol problem. I'll tell you why I was an alcoholic or am an alcoholic, recovering, you know. That's what you say. You stand up and you say, my name's Earl Everson and I'm an alcoholic because... You're never not that. The same way as a, a sinner. Hey, my name is Earl Everson, and I'm a sinner. Saved by grace. I've been saved since 2009. You know, same way with alcoholism. I'm an alcoholic. But I'm sober. I don't even know how many years. Because I'm not keeping track of it. Because I don't care anymore. Because I'm focused on Jesus. But why do you think people turn to those things? It's to escape reality. It's self-medication. It's a better place than here. Because here is hard, and here doesn't make a lot of sense, and here there's no answers. Because the world tells me to find somebody, love them, get married, have kids, have a career, retire, live a good life, and everything will be great. But that doesn't happen. You have struggled all the way through that. The person you picked to love you cheated on you. The, the money you earned was lost in, a, in the stock market. The house that you built burns down. <laughs> You never retire because you lost all your money, and now you're working at McDonald's at 65. You ever seen anybody at McDonald's at 65? It depresses me because that person, that person should be at home enjoying their, their enjoying life. But something happened. Maybe there is somebody that wants to work there and just enjoys the fellowship, and that's great. I'm not knocking that. What I'm saying is that equation, that is the wrong equation. And that is what they teach in school. One thing they didn't teach us in high school is how to balance a checkbook. That should be one of the first things you learn. 
what a credit card is and how that works, what a mortgage is. You know, none of that. I won't say it's institutionalization. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is we have to abound in these things, integrity and knowledge, and we have to be willing to share it. We have to be willing and we have to work. We have to work really hard. <laughs> we need to stop asking. We need to stop asking God to lead God and direct us if we're not truly willing to get up and walk. We gotta get up and walk. We gotta do something with it. We have to allow him to work on us if we're going to let him work through us. He's not gonna fix me, but he has to be in the process to be able to work through me. That that story is not my story. That is every person that's in the Bible, they're all imperfect. Every single one of them had something they struggled with, some sin that they asked forgiveness for. You can thank, you can thank. Uh, David's sinfulness for all the Psalms that we read. He had a tough, tough way about him and he created most of his trouble. But because of that, we have the prayers, the Psalms that we, that we get to study and we get to read and we get to hear how we're supposed to love God and God loves us through that. God works through imperfect people. Let's, let's remember to tell people that we're imperfect and, and show them that we're imperfect by the way we live. Let them come in and adapt to the way that we do church. Don't make them feel uncomfortable. They're going to feel uncomfortable anyway because they're in the presence of God. They're coming to him humbly and saying that I'm broken. What we should do is say, I've been broken too. When did he fix you? Well, <laughs> he's still working on it. You know, he's still working on it. Does anybody have anything they'd like to say before I close in prayer? Would anybody like to volunteer to close us in prayer? For JT. Dear Heavenly Father, as we prepare to leave your hands, Lord, we again ask you to heal our nation. There's things going very wrong out here in this world today. It's an attack on you, dear Lord. That's what I see. It may be not, but that's what I personally see. Attack on us Christians. We pray for our missionaries throughout this world. Amen. We pray for our servicemen of all branches. Amen. We also pray for the first responders and Amen. our our fighters and our police. Amen. They've got a rough job now. Dear Lord, we just ask you to watch over and guide them. Amen. And dear Lord, we just ask you to, to be with this country. Let us all come back to the grassroots of you, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And dear Lord, we just we just ask you to watch over us and guide us and direct us the way that you would have us to go. And we know that this riding and these uh, rebellious young people or old people or whatever the case may be this this world is not for that and dear Lord we just ask you to let our leaders come together and come back in under the one and only God as we leave here, we ask you again, dear Lord, to watch over us and guide us. Be with the ones that we have talked about here on our prayer list. We, we just ask you to heal the families. Be with the, all those that have come down with this virus because it's, it's on the uphill. It's going again. It's, it's gaining strength again. But we ask you to, to heal our nation. Dear Lord, we praise your name and we thank you for the many blessings that you give us each and every day. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank you so much for that.